Welcome to the final part of our The One Ring series, everyone. The discussion in this episode is top notch, and we even go a bit deeper into how you can work around and with the canon story within existing properties like the Lord of the Rings. I thought it was really fascinating, uh, the places we went this discussion. Definitely. Uh, but before we get to the episode, here's what is coming up in our call to action after the show. After the episode, join us for our final thoughts about the series. We'll also go over our standard asking for reviews as well as supporting our Patreon. We'll have a sneak peek of another bonus episode coming in our Patreon relatively soon. Ryan has an announcement for some upcoming bonus content headed to the One Shot Network secret archive. We do need help in order to cover some of the costs of the show. So you can okay. support us um, over at patreon.com slash character creation cast. If you want to check out what we have in our little archive over there, we've got all kinds of little goodies. Um, mm -hmm. So you can head over there while you're listening. You can sign up for things and listen to a podcast at the same time. That's it's the true. beauty of smartphones. It's, <laughs> it's so great. The things that you can do in the year of our Lord 2022. Uh-huh. Um, so we're about a third of a way to our goal for each month. So every little bit helps. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for listening, everyone. I hope you enjoy. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time we finished our session zero for the One Ring. This episode, we will be discussing the character creation process. We are excited to welcome back Steph Midlock and James Pearson. Uh, do you want to reintroduce yourselves for everybody and tell us a little bit about the characters you made? Hello, I'm Steph Midlock. Thank you for having me. I'm from the Atherbeth podcast. And last time on Character Creation Cast, I made a Hobbit of the Shire named Gilly Goodbody. She, her pronouns, please. And she is a treasure hunter is my calling. And oh, I didn't ever say my age. I'm about 40, which is sort of like a good just adult hobbit. And I am keen eyed, inquisitive and a little bit of a burglar. So, you know, she's a little bit scrappy. <laughs> um, and <laughs> let's see. I'm very hardy. I've got a short sword. And I also have a windproof lantern, so stay out of my way, because I'm going to see you no matter what. <laughs> and that's Gilly. I don't know. Amazing. So, sorry, everyone. It. Sorry. No, it's great. It was perfect. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, James, how about yourself? Hi there. I'm James Pearson. I am. Uh, I edit the Atherbeth podcast, and I also have GM'd a couple of sessions of the One Ring RPG as bonus episodes on that podcast. Um, and the character that I created last time is Drifa, daughter of Gisla. She uses she/her pronouns. Um, she's a dwarf of Durin's folk, uh, and her calling is champion. And basically, she's a pretty much straightforward like warrior. Not a lot of nuance to her. Um, as one of the aspects of her calling, um, she has enemy lore trolls, which I think denotes in her background that pre prior to joining the party, she was part of the dwarven like tunnel clearing crew that went into tunnels that were kind of, you know, hadn't been used in a while or may were maybe being expanded into and was part of the team that like went in there, fought the trolls, kicked them out of their holes so that dwarves could move in. And so she's, you know, she's got a, a hatred for trolls. She's you know, pretty much not a big, not a big thinker, pretty much just a big fighter. Um, <laughs> and she is best friends with our party's elf person who we I'm sure we'll get into later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about your character. So I've got uh, Laura Lynn. Uh, she, her pronouns and elf of Linden. Uh, she's 147 years old. Um, and on the warden calling, uh, wanting to protect the people of this world from the coming shadow that she's 
kind of been figuring out has been uh, getting more and more prominent as time goes on. Um, she is uh, she has a focus on uh, healing and on uh, singing, songwriting and playing musical instruments and making people happy. Uh, she's got a very merry uh, personality and she likes to spread that mirth whenever she can. Um, of course, she also has a secret crush on Drifa, the daughter of Gisela, because, uh, you know, the muscles as well as the, um, the muscles. <laughs> the muscles. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, um, but like the, it, she keeps it secret because like her whole life, she she's like in the society where they butt heads against the dwarves, the elves and the dwarves. And um, she doesn't think that that sort of relationship would work too well in this world, unfortunately, but she can't help her heart feel in what her heart feels. So <laughs> it Aww, is what it so is. Yeah. Um, so Amelia, uh, t- tell us about Nob. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> my character is Nob Heather Toes. Um, Nob, I think is probably, let's say a 31 year old who still lives with his mom. <laughs> um, uh, my calling is messenger. And I, I imagine that that started out as like running to the grocery store and then just kind of getting swept up in things along the way. Um, I, f- I think his parents own an inn and he kind of works there um, and just refuses to move out. It's just like not, <laughs> he's, he's smart, but not strong. Um, and he's just like kind of doing his thing. He's very happy to just stay where he's at. He does mm. not have any desire to go anywhere or do anything. But unfortunately, I don't think that's how this game works. So we're going to see how this goes for poor Nob. <laughs> I'm guessing not well. <laughs> <Probably not. laughs> uh, did we get an age for Drifa? Oh, I don't think I said. Yeah, so I think Drifa is, so dwarves typically live a little over, like probably over 100 years. I think Drifa is on the younger side. I think she's probably like 40. She's, you know, a young, young adult dwarf. Wow. Love it. We've got some well-seasoned folks in our group, too, uh, which is interesting. The youngest is, what, 37? Is that what 31. 31? Yeah, that's not, that's not super young, at least. Yep. We've, we've all seen mm-hmm. some things. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to, for a yeah. fanfic to see, uh, to see yeah, what sort of see shenanigans. Yeah, how this goes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it's going to be great. <laughs> well, uh, before we yes. get there... Uh, we have to go ahead and dive right into a segment that we're calling a D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? <laughs> a segment that Ryan calls D20 for your thoughts. <laughs> Such a great title. I it's love the ro- it. The royal we so whenever I say that. Sorry. <laughs> so in this segment, we like to talk to our guests about their thoughts on character creation process, how it relates to this system, to other games. Um, first, we always ask the most cliche question in all of RPG podcasting. Uh, how did you get into RPGs? Sure. Uh, I can I can go first. Uh, so it was the year of our Lord, 1998. <laughs> and um, I actually, this is how I met James, uh, which is so cool. Um, we... Uh, we we started gaming with our with a couple of friends in our friend's living room uh, with, I, I believe, Vampire the Masquerade mm-hmm. was my first ever, <laughs> whatever that means. Uh, and I played a gangrel and it was great. And I had no idea what was going on the entire time. I kept thinking, like, when does the board come out? <laughs> Amazing. But I was too scared to ask because I was in high school and I was a freshman and um, I was scared of boys. So I, I yeah, I <laughs> I never sense. asked. I still am wondering when the board is coming out. <laughs> it's, it's called the battle map. Oh, <laughs> heck yeah. Oh, it's only if you play with a grid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what about you, James? Yeah, I mean, my, you know, how I got into gaming is pretty much the same story. I think I maybe was into gaming a couple months before Steph was. But again, through our friend, you know, mutual friend, we've started out playing um Vampire the Masquerade. And actually, uh, I this was also how I met and became friends with Jude, Steph's co-host on Atherbeth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we started out playing, you know, I started out as a player playing Vampire the Masquerade. And then, you know, we started to branch out into other games. And I found 
the first game that I ever GM'd successfully was Call of Cthulhu. And mm. ran, you know, I sort of got into it from that aspect and, you know, quickly found out that I preferred being a GM to a player, but you know, um, yeah, that was so I mean that was quite a long time ago. I've heard that you're very good at running horror games. Well, thank you. Yeah. He is he's very spooky. It's very spooky. Ugh. We have a couple of um actual play uh one ring episodes on Atherbeth, which are we they're sort of spooky and sort of just silly. We call them spooky. Um there's one from uh October of 2020 and October 2021 that James has run if you want to check out his spooky gaming. I think you do a really good job of it. And this year we're going to finish it. It's like a three part. Oh. Um, so it'll be so the exciting conclusion just a few <laughs> minutes. It's a very slow burn. Oh, that's yeah. exciting. <laughs> I, I think I just realized how much I crave a good horror RPG session. And I, I haven't really... really been in one for ages. I think my last experience was beyond the supernatural back in the nineties for palladium. Oh, wow. And like, oh, man. even then, I don't that think was... I've ever gotten to do one. Yeah. Oh, we got a week. James, you got to run one for them. <laughs> hey, anytime. anytime. Please. <laughs> I'm inviting us along. Yes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> do it. Well, uh, what do you two look for in a system as far as character creation goes? Like what sort of pieces need to be there for for great characters to happen for you? So, I mean, so as I said, I tend to GM and I tend to prefer GMing to playing. So in a lot of, you know, for for me, in a lot of ways, you know, I, I don't. I don't intersect necessarily with the character creation process because typically when I make NPCs, I don't build them out as full, full character sheeted, you know, characters. Yeah. Um, but I know that from, you know, I know from my personal, like, the, the way that I personally like to, to play games, I like character creation systems that have a lot of flexibility because I like that, you know, I like seeing my players really inspired and coming up with unique, really interesting characters rather than sort of, you know, limited or set characters that you sort of get out of other systems like D&D, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I like systems that invite you to create like um, well-rounded characters when it comes to like vices and and backgrounds and stuff, because that just is so much of um, because it could because it can, as you as you know, like launch you even on session one right or, or session zero you already sort of know who you are if if that's part of character creation and mm -hmm. so so i really enjoy that like one of my favorite character creations to do is in legends of the five rings um because they ask you so many cool pointed questions and i feel like you end up with like a really rich character right yeah. off the get-go um and so i think those those pieces that like where you it's not just about like, hey, I'm really great at these skills, but like, oh, I'm also like I've got these vices and I've got these <laughs> this my inner conflict goes against like what I'm supposed to be doing on the surface. I love that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's so great. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, anything that promotes that yeah. is perfect. I feel like that always gives GMs a lot of hooks to pull on to like anything yeah. that has all of those like story beats. And I feel like it's always a really good indicator to a GM of like, these are the things that I'm interested in. Like, please take these things and and make them come up, up in the game. Yeah. Um, I always feel like flaws are where characters start to really come together for me. When they don't have flaws, I feel very one dimensional. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a great point. Um, so we like to look at character sheets because I think they can tell us kind of a lot about what playing a game is going to be like, what things are important. Um, so what kind of story do you think that these character sheets tell us like when you're just sitting down to make a character like what kind of vibe do you get there yeah well i mean i think like off off the get-go this is not a super like detailed character sheet mm -hmm. right it's not um it it doesn't ask too much of players so i think like from that standpoint it's really good in uh in that it's not too scary i think for like newer players mm -hmm to jump into this this character creation process the sheet itself um we talked about this a little bit in the first section but the the writers were very um deliberate in like the words the vocabulary mm -hmm. words that they chose um to follow along with what jrr tolkien would have written himself if he was writing a character sheet right. so it fits <laughs> it feels very in world this feels to me like an in world document which i really like um uh and I think like, uh, yeah, I, I, I think 
I think in a way, I almost wish there were like more more things to add. But maybe that's maybe that's OK, because that stuff comes later and you add that later. I don't mm. know. What do you think, James? Yeah, I think that the layout of the character sheet is really interesting, too. Like if you look at it, it's divided into essentially three main columns with like your attribute at the top and then the skills that flow from that attribute mm. below it. And so, I mean, it really it really calls everything back to the core mechanics of rolling against the target number that's set by your attribute. So like everything that flows underneath strength, for instance, you're going to roll against your strength target number. So it's very mm -hmm. like well organized, although I don't know if I necessarily agree how some of these skills, like the attribute, some of these skills fall under. I don't know if that necessarily mm -hmm. makes sense, but I think that it's laid out in a very like it all drives back to that core mechanic. Right. Yeah, that, it's really interesting uh, how how it is. It's, it's easy to read. Um, the thing that that stuck out uh stood out to me the most was the design of the sheet right mm -hmm. like the you've got the the elvish uh script at the top of the sheet and and you've got some like nice natural like leafy looking things at the bottom and it's it's very evocative of like you're playing in this very fantastical world um and and like th it feels historical Right. Mm -hmm. Like you're playing in in a historical setting, which is well, really we talked interesting. about that with like the book, too, that like the yeah. art and that kind of stuff in the book um, feels very evocative and very reminiscent of the the original like source material. And I feel like the character sheet design goes along with that. Pretty Absolutely. Well. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we talked about too that this is such a known um, like world for all of us. So like you've, uh, I, I, it would be hard to find anyone who hasn't who doesn't know what it is, right? And so even if this is a new game to you, this should feel it feels familiar, right? Mm -hmm. Like Ryan said with the Tenguar text, the Elvish up at the top, and and even the font of like the One Ring, it looks so much like you know what we know from Pete Jackson's movies. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's something that I think that's nice, and it's kind of disarming. Like it's like okay, I know. All right, all right, okay. I, I got this. Yeah, it's, I can it's do familiar, this. right? I will say yeah. that, like, when I first sat down to look at it, like, there's a lot of boxes. Um, <laughs> I mean, and it turns out that, like, most of them are, you know, like, just boxes that you kind of tick and, like, tally marks and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it does look a little bit <laughs> like it. I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, having gone through it now, it's like, oh, OK, it's very clear what goes where, yeah. and, which is something that I always look for, because sometimes you sit down to play a game and you're like, the book is like, so here's this derived stat. And you're like, cool cool but like where does it go <laughs> yeah. it's like there's not a box for that <laughs> yeah. um, and so we didn't have any of that it was very clear where everything goes and it does kind of flow um in the order of creation and stuff too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's actually something that they did a better job of on the fillable pdf than on the character sheet that's in the book because the fillable pdf had your derived stats sort of like right with your attributes and stuff like that um and here Oh, actually, no, I take that back. It's all laid out pretty, pretty well here. This sidebar, though, that has like your adventure points, skill points, current endurance and stuff like that. It kind of forces you to go back and forth across the sheet. I like having your current values near your max values to make everything really like simplified, which is something I think they did on the, the fillable PDF that they didn't do on the sheet. Um, that makes it just mm -hmm. a little bit busier and a little hard, to, harder to use. Mm -hmm. I didn't look. Yeah. Like now that you mentioned it, like looking at like what yeah. things go like what skills go with what like why does battle go with heart and craft goes with strength yeah that bothers me <laughs> or song with strength right <laughs> yeah like why is song with strength like uh, yeah it's it's interesting know. like i don't strength, think i would put that there <laughs> maybe strength of presence versus strength maybe. of body or you know whatever i something don't know like i just that. feel like song should go with heart yeah. maybe mm -hmm. okay now that you mentioned it it's gonna bother me but all right that's fine <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if like song is like the, I don't know, like, like almost like a fortification, like it gives you an emotional strength after you yeah. hear a rousing mm. song. It's actually just all that like um, breath work that you have to do. Yeah. <laughs> right. <Yep. Yep. laughs> the breath work. Yep. You gotta, you gotta so hold true. that note. <laughs> uh, mu muscle memory. I think memory. that these are, yeah, right. Exactly. I, I think, I think that looking at the descriptions of these in the book are quite helpful yeah. because I think, I think, um. Yeah, they 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 don't. I think they there's don't more exactly to it. Like jump than... off the page. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. 
Plus, I mean, mechanically, you have to you have to think. Well, we're doing six, six, and six, right? So if it, mm-hmm. if you moved all the things that made sense under heart, that makes sense to go under heart. You know, might you might have eight, nine skills there, and now oh, and then you, those would be uneven numbers, and that might be even worse. You're right, exactly. But then, <laughs> right. like, okay, well, if I put all my points into heart, <laughs> then you know I can power game a bit because now I'm good at nine things as opposed to four. That's you true. Ah, uh, true. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I see what yeah. you're saying. I looked I'll up, allow it. <laughs> I looked up song, the skill, the song skill in the book, and they specifically call out that it's a strength skill because you have to have a clear singing voice. Mm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Jeez Louise. You do have to work Very at that. Reason. My youngest sibling is a singer and you have to like they like you have to work at that. Yeah. That's true. Oh, I need a strong right. core. Condition I'll allow your it. body. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. There you mm-hmm. go. Get those calluses <laughs> yeah. on your fingers for the well, light. Yeah, you know, like well, and you gotta like be silent the whole day before you have to do it and mm-hmm. you know, like drink your lemon water or whatever. Yep. I don't know. Yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> Maybe they're just making a big show of it and it's really not that big of a deal. Maybe they're <laughs> just being dramatic because that seems like a thing they would do. But uh, there you go. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> how how do we think character creation in the one way, one in the one ring stacks up to other systems that we've played and created characters for? Good question. I feel like it was um like there was enough options mm-hmm. happening that like I had enough choices to make, but it was always um contained so there was no like analysis paralysis or sort of like that paralyzing Mm. you know feeling of like too many options in front of me like there was never more than like you know six to ten things or whatever to pick from yeah um, which i really like so there was enough there to feel like there was variety but not so much that i was like i don't even know where to start yeah i Mm -hmm. do like that it it, that most of the things that have options are six options So Mm -hmm. really, if you Mm -hmm. wanted to go through and just roll a random character, you just roll a bunch of D6s and call it a day. And Mm -hmm. most of your character is defined at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have a few choices. You have a few uh, skills to figure out, hey, is this a skill that I favor or not? You know, Mm -hmm. and then and then you're good from there. Uh, I both love that and felt like it was a little too odd rails for my taste Mm -hmm. like i still liked the character creation system here and i i feel like we created great characters that we fleshed out pretty well but like if somebody makes the same choices at me as me it's practically the same person at -hmm. that point because there's not too much deviation between an elf of linden and a warden between who who's who right yeah right Mm mm-hmm yeah, no, it's true. It and it, I think so that that sort of asks the player. It asks more of the player, yeah. right? Yeah. To then define yourself further to differentiate yourself. Like if if we're both wardens, okay, then how am I going to do that as an elf versus mm-hmm. how would a hobbit be a warden, mm-hmm. right? Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Still better yeah. than D and D, though, in my opinion. Because yeah. like D and D, if you're a paladin, you're a paladin. Right. period yeah. and like your your it's racial true. uh choice has very little to do with that and you yeah. have to introduce a lot in D D to create a unique character from that right yeah. a lot yeah. of it is unwritten non-mechanical stuff which is always my <laughs> always yeah. my problem with that <laughs> right. game and people are like check out this cool thing i'm doing and i'm like but that's you that's not the yeah. game doesn't do that for you mm-hmm. yeah that's a great yeah, point. It's, That's a great th- this point. feels like taking that background portion of D&D and blowing it up to something that's more meaningful, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and then you've got the other stuff that that is also meaningful on the other side of the coin for what you can do, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Um, and so kind of mushing those together, it's, it's simple, which I like. It's easy mm-hmm. to create a character. But um, yeah, it, there's just something a little more to nudge it in that direction, I think would be great. But then you're compl- making it more complex at the right. same time. So I'm like, well, there's a trade off somewhere. Right. Right. Yeah. There's, there's somewhere between like ease and simplicity and like that, you know, depth that you're looking for. And there's, yes. it's a fine balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think one of the things that, you know, to use D&D as an example, you know, your 
your like your race only provides a little bit of context and the majority of your character is derived from your class. Here, they kind of flip the script. The majority of our character was defined through our culture. And then mm-hmm. your calling, which I think is the closest thing you could equate to a class, only gives you a couple of extra skills and one more one more feature, um, which I think makes sense for the setting, you know, because yeah. a lot of the aspects of the character come from the culture they come from rather than the job that they do or the, you know, the reason they're out adventuring. Um, mm-hmm. But it also sort of feels a little bit like, let's do it this way to differentiate ourselves from D&D. I, it's probably, I'm sure that's not the decision, why they made that decision, but it feels mm-hmm. like we essentially have two, you know, one thing that's heavier and one thing that's lighter. For D&D, it's class versus race, and here it's culture versus uh, mm-hmm. color, you know? Yeah. But it's that very very fitting for the Lord of the Rings world, too, where, like, uh, pretty much all the the culture is huge in mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings, and yeah. those individual yeah. cultures are, like, very... Uh, you know, yeah, where you come out. from determines most of what you're doing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So very on brand. In the first part of this uh, podcast, we made the point that um, <clears throat> the book sort of asks you to think about your character in relationship to like where they are in their geography mm-hmm. in the idea that, uh, uh, you know, this is not an informational world. There's not a you know, you're not someone from, uh, you know, Brie may not have ever seen an elf before who knows right Mm -hmm. so like you yeah so they that is something at character creation i think maybe that's why like the cultures are so important Mm -hmm. because you really know your own pretty well but like not maybe the others Mm -hmm. as much as you would elsewhere yeah 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 one thing that i don't think that this system did as well going back to that conversation we were having a little bit earlier about how l5r's character creation gives you a lot of open-ended questions that like basically build your background as part of the character creation I feel like this one only had a few opportunities to develop what our backgrounds are based on the mechanics of the character creation itself. You know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like I grabbed onto, you know, like from my calling, I got that enemy lore, like distinctive feature. And so I use like that hooked something in my brain. I was like, oh, okay, why do they hate trolls? Okay, well, then they were part of this troll squad, you know, and from that I can I can know, you know, one thing that I'm personally interested in is like subverting the, you know, like these characters are like these ra- these cultures are good these cultures are evil trope so one thing that i would be interested in for my character is like seeing if they're seeing if the you know her perception of trolls as all evil and needing to be destroyed is incorrect and you know finding sort of a common ground there but mm-hmm. none of that came from the mechanic you know right yeah i do feel like we got a lot of these like broad categories of things mm-hmm. that it's like you know like messenger and it's like okay mm-hmm. so that needs to tie in somehow um but i feel like the rest of like the the personality and like the story of my character was sort of left to me to like it's like you have this pile of things mm-hmm. so like now you make something out of it yeah um yeah there wasn't a lot the, the game didn't do a lot of that work for you yeah i still don't know exactly why uh my character is here in brie aside mm-hmm. from i've yeah. i was out traveling i have a calling to uh, protect people from the shadow and somehow that meandered my way here with this group yeah and uh, so so mm-hmm. it's 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 very high level right yeah we don't have the specifics of like oh you know five years ago i had this altercation with so and so and this person was there to help me with it and now we're you know tied together mm-hmm yeah. So the question is, like, I mean, so obviously that leaves a lot to the players and the GM to come up with, like, OK, why are we here? Um, but on the other hand, it probably means you don't end up with a bunch of people who have come in with these very disparate stories that the GM has to, like, figure out how to put together, um, yeah. which is, you know, something that I think can happen in a lot of games is that you go home, you make your character and you're like, here's my 12 pages of backstory that don't match anybody else at the table. (laughs) Uh Um, Whereas when you come in with nothing, then there's more room to sort of work together on that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether that's for good or ill. (laughs) (laughs) This game does kind of give the GM the, the cheat code though, of having the patron, like, you know, uh, you can always just say, well, Gandalf, comes meets you and tells you hey i've got these other people who you'd like come come on a mission with us you know right and like i said you don't say no to gandalf so yeah that's (laughs) sort of solves that whole problem right there (laughs) (laughs) as people who have played this game several times um how do you feel like the process of character creation 
informs what you're going to be doing in the game? Like, how does it sort of reinforce the feeling of the game? Or does it? Yeah, we thought about this a little bit. I think one thing I want to call out is the company creation, which is part of character creation. I think that uh, the, the bringing your party together in, in like a formal big C company um, really enforces the importance of who you of 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 adventure and traveling and who you're going mm-hmm. with right <laughs> as we as we were creating our characters we kept saying like oh wow we're so well rounded we've got all these different you know he- heroic cultures being represented and we all have different callings like wow that's really that's really cool um mm-hmm. and because this is very much um a, i think at its core you know, a game about fellowship and about coming together. So I think, yeah, coming up with that company stuff, your fellowship focus, um, you know, where a place where you guys feel safe. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's also really neat because you, these are opportunities where you can, if you want to interact with canon things, which again, I think is quite a thrill for folks who love this material. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're the patrons, at least that you start out with are, are known characters um, from, from the books and uh, like it's likely um, or you know, it doesn't have to be, but you can choose a canonical location as like we did with the prancing pony mm-hmm. for your safe mm-hmm. haven. Mm-hmm. And so this is a great way for these new characters to kind of interact a little bit. Um, it doesn't have to be about these things. You know, it's your patron is not the only thing we're going to do but you yeah. know what we're going to but it's a great it's a great um uh way for those roads to meet and i think that's that's really mm-hmm. cool i think that reinforces the feeling definitely well I, we we talked a bit about some of the flaws of the system in a previous question but uh what do you what do you think is one of the biggest flaws i wonder if like i th- i don't know and you guys can let me know what you think about this but like i think almost the the setting of Ariador, it's not a flaw at all Mm -hmm. but i want more from the setting Mm -hmm. i really want to be able to go to fangorn for it you Mm -hmm. know i want to be able to go over the mountains now of course as we said you can do this if you incorporate the first edition as well because those are known things but this game really does want you to focus in Ariador. that's the point of it and i think that's great but i do I don't know, you know, I, I feel like people want to go to Mordor and you really are not <laughs> invited to go to Mordor in this book, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Without a little bit of finagling. What do you think, James? Yeah, I was at that. I absolutely agree. One of the so when the second edition first came out, I read a review. I forget which website it was on. It was like Polygon or, or Dicebreaker or something like that. Um, and one of the things that they explicitly called out is that this system, at least from their understanding of it, is not one where you're going on epic quests and, you know, taking the one ring to Mordor. It's one where it's often times that your character will be, you know, helping Farmer Maggot muck out his stables. I think it was the mm. example that they used, which at the same time, when I read that review, I'd been running this game for Steph, Jude, and a couple of our friends where we were on this epic quest doing all this stuff. And I had to think about it for a little bit. And in order to get the epic quest, I had to draw on resources from outside of the main core book. You know, like yeah. we started in we started in Rohan. So I had to go back to the the version, you know, the the first edition book and then use Tolkien Gateway for all of the, you know, all of the places that aren't covered in the book. So, yeah, I think that the scope of the adventures as written in the book can be a little bit limited, you know. Mm-hmm. Is that is that a product of the game itself or is that a product of like how much stuff Tolkien has written though? Like, is that, you know, a question of like the legendarium is so big yeah. that like at, at what point do you say like the book would be too much if we put all of those things mm-hmm. in there? You know, That's and like you sort point, of yeah. lose some of that accessibility, especially for newer people, the mm-hmm. more stuff you put in there. I think that's, that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I bet that's exactly why they chose it. Well, it, it's also ripe for expansions, right? Ripe for right. supplements. Right. I mean, there materials. is also money to be made there by, <laughs> by, by like making <laughs> you know all do. of those supporting books. But, too. Right. But I mean, I mean, it does tell me like if I didn't even know the first edition existed, which I didn't until I did the research. It was like, okay, well, if if this is just one small area of the world, when can I get the rest? Because I mm-hmm. know expansions are coming, and those supplements are going to be 
coming for this because this game's pretty cool. So like then it's just a matter of time of waiting and when you jump into it. But the fact that first edition books are out there already and you can kind of finagle it into this system uh, pretty easily, um, you know, that that kind of keeps that epicness and open worldness to it. But yeah, if you're coming in with just the core book, yeah, it is. It is a little limiting, but Mm -hmm. that's not to say you can't start the seeds of an epic adventure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think you're totally right. Like it's you make a starting character, the scope of what they, of the adventures that they get into uh, would be by their nature more limited, you know? Although mm-hmm. that does kind of fly in the face of the source material because, you know, the first time Frodo leaves the Shire, it's to take the one ring to Rivendell and then he ends up going all the way to Mordor. <laughs> so, right. yeah. Um, I mean, and I know too, talking about expansions, uh, I think it was as part of the Kickstarter, they've already released the Rivendell expansion book mm. so i'm sure that there's more yeah online. absolutely yeah. and there's also one called like ruins of the lost realm which gives you um like yeah just some another additional map of other cities and other cool stuff um one thing i wanted to note that is really cool about this so because just to follow to kind of dovetail in with this idea of like yeah i want my character to be able to go on like bigger more stuff there is a really nifty mode that was recently released for this game called strider Mm. mode Mm -hmm. which we haven't talked about yet um and it is a it is a means to do this as a solo game um so you don't need uh a lore master for this you can do it all by yourself um and the idea is you can take uh you can create your own character for this or you could take an, your pre-existing character and give them their own side quest mm. um uh and there's like new tables that can sort of help to answer like the questions that you might ask to a lore master or whatever um and like tables that can kind of give you for like good stuff and bad stuff that happened to you along the way but these and and it sort of modify it gives you some additional rules to facilitate that solo play and so um i I like that that option is there i don't know if i necessarily would do it just because i don't know i never do anything (laughs) blurp but it's there <laughs> if you want to but yeah. again like yeah I, again like at, at just from a character creation standpoint yeah you're not gonna you're not gonna get that yeah. you have to go beyond mm-hmm. yeah 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 there's been a there's been a plethora of like solo games and sort of a push for solo games um in recent years is something i saw like a lot in the ennies in mm-hmm. the last two years is like a lot mm-hmm. of solo games mm-hmm. um because yeah. I, th- yeah. I think People are like, pandemic, I'm alone. <laughs> I want a game to play. Um, yeah, and it's been interesting to see the ones that, like, because when it started out, it was a lot of just, like, journaling. Um, mm-hmm. And I've seen more and more that are like, no, let's take an actual game with actual mechanics that you can do things. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. And it's mm-hmm. cool to see, like, some established games starting to make that an option mm-hmm. rather than yeah. just an entire game that is a solo game. Yeah, yeah that's super cool. Mm-hmm. I'd be very curious yeah. if you could take those rules for a solo game here and expand it to a group and just have a GM-less kind of experience, right? Oh. Oh, that's a great idea. That, mm. I think that, that could be a lot of fun, potentially. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, absolutely. Don't even need Jude. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs Jude? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, brother. <laughs> Um, it is time for our favorite section. This is where we where we discuss what would happen if we played this game, or as we f- refer to it, our fanfic section. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. What what kind of game would we play, and what do we think would happen? Like, what would be mm-hmm. what What is Gandalf sending us? Yeah, to do? The, uh, Gandalf's the X factor here, right? Right. Because I was like, well, mm-hmm. how? Why are we all together in the first place? And it's like, well, because Gandalf, Gandalf told us Gandalf, to, right? right. <laughs> Yeah. I, can, I can I can easily see Gandalf meeting each of us individually and mm-hmm. just being like, mm-hmm. on this day at this moon phase, go to the Prancing Pony. Yeah. There you will meet <laughs> three other individuals. That's a great Sir Ian yeah. impression. I love that. <laughs> it's great. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, like that's the thing. Like Gandalf like looks for like not only your like, I mean, I think like, yeah, 
his emphasis is not on a highborn person, for example. His emphasis is on like the 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 strength of one's heart, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, oh, that's so not great could, either. <laughs> 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 or at least like the, or, or at least like there's something in your being that Gandalf, as a patron, can see and say that this person will add something to this group that yeah. they need, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's all about balance. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, at the at, at the at the end of the day, we are we are all working to fight to fight in some way or at least to to push back against the enemies of the free mm, people. So right. that is pretty broad. You can do that in lots of different ways. And so um yeah. Yeah. I think the like the probably the best indicator is to look at our callings. Cause like, mm-hmm. you know, obviously like for the warden, you know, so we have a warden, and I think that that's we have a warden, right? Yes. yes. So we, we have Ryan, a warden. Right? So obviously it, it, it means that what we're doing should involve protecting some people, um, mm-hmm. you know, and we have a messenger. So, you know, there could be an aspect of needing to travel some distance. Um, and I think mm-hmm. the, the key also is that we have a treasure hunter. So wherever we're going, it's going to need to be like, mm. in order to, to have that calling hook into all of this there needs to be an aspect of finding something that was lost or finding a treasure or something like that um Mm. so you can kind of take the callings and use those to sort of point us in a general direction uh based on that yeah oh nice i I do like that a lot one of the things going back to gandalf as a patron one of the things that i've always thought is super cool is like so in the hobbit he shows up and he's just like yeah you know i met uh i met uh thorin's dad he told me that there's like a treasure um, and he gave me a map. Why don't you dwarves go and like find the treasure? And it's like super straightforward, very simple. Just like, hey, dwarves, I'm going to help you out. Go, go get your ancestral home back. When you get to the appendices of Lord of the Rings, one of the things that it says in the appendix is that Gandalf was worried that when Sauron came back, he was going to use the dragon Smaug to fight and destroy the, the free people. And so he was like, OK, I got to take care of this dragon. And I know these dwarves want to take their home back. I'll tell these dwarves to go get the treasure and they'll take out the dragon for me while they're doing it. So his (laughs) involvement as a patron means that he doesn't even need to tell us what exactly we're doing. He could be pointing us in the direction of something way bigger and more tied into the the larger meta plot. But we could just think, oh, you know, we got to go find this golden cup of, you know, whomever Mm -hmm. in this in this barrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Ooh. I feel like that would be really fun in a campaign, especially like a long running campaign over time to like yeah. slowly put those pieces together. Um, but also Absolutely. a lot of planning work. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's interesting because you could you could make up something like some MacGuffin that is tied to some big threat that's never even mentioned in the movies or the books or anything like that. And mm-hmm. just say, well, we took care of that threat. So that's why it was never mentioned. Yeah. Right. Because mm-hmm. it was taken yeah. care yeah. of in that gap between the the stuff there. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that, you know, one of the things too, you know, in the Lord of the Rings, it's, you know, uh, Rohan and Gondor fighting against uh, Mordor at the same time. And this is mentioned, I think, in the in like the, the appendices or the histories or whatever. Um, up in the north in Mirkwood, the elf king Thranduil, who's up there and like the hobbits ran into in the hobbit, like his forces are fighting Sauron's forces in the north to keep them from coming down and joining the battle as well. So it's not even mentioned at all in the Lord of the Rings, but there are battles going on all over the place that allow the heroes to be successful in their, you know, in the final battle at Mordor. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so hopefully this should be freeing to people that feel like, oh, I don't know the lore. I don't know if I really want to play that game. Like, it doesn't matter. You, yeah. It doesn't matter if you don't know. Mm-hmm. Like, it, everything is valid. Mm-hmm. Everything, you know, mm-hmm. everything can can mean something. And I think it also helps you just jumpstart and just let, let's just get going. Like, I know Amelia said, oh, you know, you need a lot of pre-planning, like, and can figure it out later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think that's a really good point, Ryan, though, to say that, like, well, you know, the reason that it was never mentioned in any of those books or anything is because, like, it was taken care of. Like, yeah. we solved yeah. it. So it didn't need to be mentioned in the books because right. it was, yeah. already, you know, it was already done yeah. before anything <laughs> came up. Like, we we took care of it. Um, it's true. In the um, uh, in the we talked about um, the nerd of the rings is uh, 
interview with Francesco Nepotello, the person who made this game. Um, he Francesco said in the starter box, there are pre-made characters and two of them are like Frodo's parents who we know canonically drown. Right. And that is why Frodo over time ends up with Bilbo. Mm -hmm. Right. And setting our story. He's like, you can reverse that. You can play them. Why don't you play them and save their life and see how that changes things? So I think it's also OK to mess with canon if you want to, like, mm -hmm. you know, depending on yeah. how everyone in your party feels about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's just an alternate history of the of this fantasy yeah. world, which right. is still totally. fun. You know, or you could say, you know, like we know the only thing we know about, you know, Frodo's dad is that there's Frodo's parents is that they drowned in a boating accident. Why were they in a boat? Were they on an adventure that Gandalf sent them on to like go recover something? And on the way back, the boat was attacked by orcs and they drowned, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. you can mm -hmm. even paint in around the line, like paint right up to the line, you know, uh, that's mm -hmm. already established. Or or did they not drown at all and then they're just missing and presumed to yeah. have drowned? Ooh. Ooh. Right? They had to fake oh, their I love that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Something happened and then, yeah, it's a, it's a big conspiracy now. <laughs> <laughs> Probably yeah. created by those trolls. <laughs> so, so did any of our characters know each other beforehand or did we just uh, get spirited away by Gandalf to the, the Prancing Pony and that was our first time meeting and... And and we had to do some mundane thing at first that seemed innocuous, but maybe set something up down the line. Well, I think we said that Gilly and Nob know each other because okay. it's like, I mean, we're pretty close together and it seems reasonable that you would have come to whatever yeah. in my parents own that I live in. Um, exactly. And so, you know, we've been friends or friendly. Um, yeah. But I don't know about anybody else yeah because because my character um uh you're not the Lorman, adventuring type not really the adventuring type well the my culture is usually like just stay in linden mm -hmm. stay here and yeah. why why go out you know Build in 300 years you're going to be going to a boat anyway so you know might as well just stick around here yeah. um yeah. But I can I can imagine like staying there, growing up, learning about the shadow, learning about these patterns, and and then starting to go out on my own, mm -hmm. and happenstance running into Gandalf, mm -hmm. and having this like you know buddy cop uh, sort of scenario with Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> for a short period of time and then like Gandalf's like you know hey uh if I ever need something can I can I call on you and I'd be yeah. like yeah, yeah sure and then actually Gandalf's like let me introduce you to the love of your life right exactly <laughs> there's a little me cute <laughs> a little me cute yeah. situation <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of Gandalf the matchmaker right well, <laughs> well, I'm yeah. very into Great. that <laughs> how, how does Dreefa get there then I think, I mean, maybe this is maybe a little too like meta, but I think it makes sense for Drifa at least to come in and meet, at least to meet Laurelin as part of this, this party. Because we know from, you know, like the reason why Legolas and Gimli being best friends is such a big deal is because it's pretty rare. You yeah. know, it mm -hmm. sort of flies in the face of a lot of, you know, a lot of sort of established like prejudice between those two cultures. Um, so I think that if, Drifa and Laura Lynn are friends prior to getting into the party. Um, I, I would go the other way where they first meet as part of this, this thing and their friendship is built through the, mm. like, maybe they have this, this moment where they have a connection, but their friendship and all that is built as part of the game um, yeah. to build on that relationship. So it's not, so it remains as sort of a rare thing, you know? I like mm -hmm. that. I think one thing we always say on Afterbeth is we, we like to point out the importance of fan fiction because Tolkien, you know, is great and all those things, but also there's a lot of stuff missing um, mm -hmm. from, from Tolkien's writings and that, and that's okay to talk about those things and to embrace those things and to, and to embrace the things that are not great, right? right. The, the, the bad prejudices and all those mm -hmm. things that are in, that are, that are present. Um, we need to embrace those things and, um, and it's okay that they exist and it's but it's also okay for us to to recreate and to add in places yeah. where things are missing, mm -hmm. things that are important are missing, um, different kinds of relationships. Um, and so I think like that would be the kind of story I would want to do is to like look beyond 
just like a, and I, I want to look for the places where we can add, add in those things. Yeah. Um, and so I think like your, your example of that friendship and then possibly more would be, would be really wonderful and, and would fill a great need. I feel like that's one thing that I love about um, role-playing games in like, you know, like other like intellectual properties is like the ability to sort of do the like the fix it fic um, of your own <laughs> game and to be able to say like, I wish it would have gone this way. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to make it go this way. Like I'm going to solve that problem that like there isn't representation for this thing or mm. that this part of the story is bad or whatever. Um, and to be yeah. able to say like at my table, we're going to fix that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Love that. That's so mm-hmm. great. Yeah. All right, should we get into our advancement segment that I hate the name of? <laughs> do, you, do we want uh, to take, we take it, it up, up a level? level? <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 Air horn sounds. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. Uh, in this segment, we cover what character advancement and character growth looks like in the system. Um, so let's start with how do characters level up mechanically in this game? And what, you know, what do they change as they do that? So at the end of each session, every player gets three adventure points and three skill points. Like it's set per session. This is the, this is the number that you get. Um, you accumulate these points over the course of the adventuring phase. And then when you get to the fellowship phase, which if you remember, the game is broken up into two, essentially two phases, the adventuring phase, which is where you're out in the world doing your thing. And then the fellowship phase, which is where you return to a place of safety, your home base or someplace safe. And it's the downtime phase where you rest, you recover, you do undertakings, which are things like, um, you know, studying maps or writing songs, things like that. And the fellowship phase is also where you can spend those points to raise your skills and your uh, and to gain uh, virtue uh, to gain um, valor and wisdom. Okay, uh, and does does that have like any? Is there any narrative impact? Like there there's a reason why this stuff's increasing versus this other thing, or is it just now that the adventure's over, we have time to reflect and and now we've got extra abilities, extra skills. Yeah, I think I think um, that's I, advancement is tied to the fellowship phase. So we talked about the two phases of this mm-hmm. game that alternate the the adventure phase, adventuring phase where you're out in the world doing stuff. And then the fellowship phase, which is a more introspective phase. You're resting in a safe haven or something. And you're, um, yeah, kind of thinking about um, what has just happened and telling your story. So the fellowship phase, you know, um, you it's sort of. In a way, I mean, it's not mechanical, I don't think, but you can kind of choose your advancements based on what you just did in your adventure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and because and because it happens like, you know, two or three sessions and then a fellowship phase, two or three sessions, you you have um, it, it sort of grows naturally, which I really like. It's not just like, oh, OK, I went back to school and figured this out. It's I was I was just hanging out with a bunch of rangers. And so mm-hmm. I they taught they were kind enough to teach me some some tricks with the bow and arrow. And now all of a sudden. And so now I'm going to mm-hmm. knock up my arrow, mm-hmm. my proficiency in arrows yeah. uh, uh, or bows up. And so I think like, yeah, it's really beautifully done that way um in the fellowship phase yeah yeah i don't think it yeah like you said i don't think it's strictly required but i think it it sort of guides you towards using what you just did to to guide you know like to guide what you're what you're increasing you know Mm -hmm. and also with the uh valor and wisdom if you we discussed this in the first section but so valor is sort of your reputation in the world and wisdom is the sort of knowledge that you gain through your experiences you can kind of look and say okay well in these last sessions we saved a town and we became the heroes of this town i'm going to increase my valor it makes sense to do that or you know you know wisdom like you know we learned some some key lore and now i have a better understanding of the history of middle earth i'm going to raise my wisdom it you know done right i think it all flows out of what we what, what you were just doing Mm. yeah i think that makes a lot of sense yeah i know Mm. one of the examples is we went through a dungeon and now i know more about sailing 
Um, that's, and, yeah, that's the one I always yeah. get. Yeah, I always give. It's like I hate when games like you you level up and it's like it has nothing to do with right. you know with the yeah. It's like okay, I spent a lot of time in in a cave and now right. I have a sailing skill. But, and... but even here, right? Like I can I can justify it if you're if you're leveling up during the fellowship phase. You're like I, I just spent the last like five weeks in a dungeon. I want to mm-hmm. learn about something that's the exact opposite of a dungeon <laughs> to kind of cleanse yeah. my palate. So I'm just right. going to learn about sailing during this time. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to read a book about wide open spaces. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm going yeah, to you can justify it if yeah. you wanted yeah. to. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah, so you could just buy the numbers. Oh, I, I want to increase my hunting just because um, even though we didn't do any hunting, but maybe mm. it'll be good down the line. Um, right. Because, you know. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're hunting th- while you're traveling. You're, you're doing all this stuff. So, yeah, it makes sense that you'll just pick up on things here and there. Yeah. I also feel like looking at these skills that, like, I can't imagine that there are very many of them that, like, you wouldn't have reason to level up. Like, yeah. I feel like when I think about yeah. the things that you would do in a game, there aren't a lot of them that, like, would not be applicable. Right. It's not hyper you know? specific, right? Right, right. Yeah, I don't think there's even a sailing skill on here. No, no. there's not. I checked before I oh. said that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at character creation, you have yet to go through an adventuring phase in which you have to do a journey. And so I think like you, unless you've read the whole book, like as a player, which I don't always do, mm-hmm. right? When I'm creating a character, I have no idea what's in store for me. And so I think those first fellowship phases where you're those first few times where you're adding um, some points in to sort of make it so you can make it through a journey and it not take 20 days Mm. right to get a little hex on a map um i think that's uh (laughs) i think that of course comes with experience Mm -hmm. yes but yeah well and also you know the fellowship phase has in the book the fellowship phase has a a minimum duration it has to be at least a week that your character is arresting. It has no maximum duration. So it could all, mm-hmm. it could even be, you know, we return to the Shire after our adventure. And for the next year, I trained myself on the sword because just the next time we're going out in the world, I need to be better with the sword, you know? So depending mm-hmm. on yeah. what the GM says too, there, you know, you could even just do it that way. And that, when you think about if you're playing a company of elves, like, you know, you can take 20 years to become a really good oh. sailor. That is an eye blink to an elf. Yes. That's right. That who's going to live thousands and, you know what I mean? Like, so that really changes things a uh-huh. lot. Um, and you can, I feel like you could really, you know, while you, whilst you may not have like the points for it, you can't, you can also save points too. That's the other important mm-hmm. thing. Like you don't have to spend them all. Um, and so, and so then if you do take like a big longer break um, and you really want to upgrade, you can do a big one. Yeah. And I think that would be really neat to re-examine someone, you know, or, or even like a company like ours, that's very mixed, right? We have a human, we have a hobbit. Those are going to live a certain amount of time. We have a dwarf who's going to live a little longer, but then we have an elf. Like what if like we come back, right. And my, and like Amelia and I are like, elderly Mm -hmm. and you and ryan is still in the spring of you know uh, of of laurelin's life like how would that change you know the stakes yeah what a what a wonderful thing to think about like that would be Mm -hmm. so interesting i could easily see a campaign of this being like one character is an elf and then it's multi-generational for the other characters yeah like yeah like you play different people throughout this one elf's life and you're skipping 20 30 years but i just got goosebumps yeah Yeah, but then the fellowship points are like okay i've got the or we got three adventure three skill points to divide but that's going to the next character Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. and Ooh. this is, that's actually like, so in that interview that we watched with Francesco Nepotello, one of the things that he did specifically call out is that the game is intended, is intended to be generational. Um, and there's a mechanic that's part of advancement, which, so you have your normal fellowship phase. And then once a year, you have what's called the Yule fellowship phase, which is mm. you know, essentially Christmas. Um, and <laughs> there are certain things that you can only do during the Yule fellowship phase. Um, it's meant to be like a big milestone. You know, I would think it would be something that you would do at the end of a campaign rather mm-hmm. than at the end of just an adventuring session. Um, and one of the things that you do during Yule is, a, is an undertaking called raising an heir, where you literally mm. spend your points 
to create a pool of points that you use to create to give to uh, to use to generate the next character. Oh, um, that's really cool. And like, if your character dies without having raised an heir, the the book tells you, okay, we'll roll up a new character. But if you die after raising an heir, then you just seamlessly pick up as your your heir character. So it's like Bilbo and Frodo. You know, Bilbo oh, wow. raised Frodo as his heir, and Frodo's there for the the journey after he after Bilbo retires. Oh, I like that. Oh, that's really cool. Absolutely. Really like and that, that. And that's a great example of using it like a first edition character mm-hmm. or or even like, yeah, setting your game farther in the past and then bringing them forward. That's I just think that's lovely mm-hmm. and, and very fascinating. Yeah. Oh, that's so neat. Yeah. That would be really fun. Uh, 150 years past the start date. Frodo still hasn't taken the ring because he lost it. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I know totally I said do it down that. somewhere. Nobody knows where it is. <laughs> Keep it secret. Keep it safe. It's a little too safe, Gandalf. I don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I, it, is there anything else that we want to say before we, we close off this? this? This was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. This was, this was great. great. It yeah. was so fun. You know, as I said, we've played this game a lot, but um, uh, going back in and really getting into like, why, why, I, I just really like that your show asks us to look just beyond the numbers and like really look at like why the character sheet is set up that way and what are they thinking about and how does that actually relate to the game? I think, I think because we, we've said a few times now, like the writers were so intentional with everything in this game. It's all about world building. Mm-hmm. I think like, when you really focus on the character creation part of it, like it, it launches you directly into Tolkien's world, which is like the best thing in the whole yeah. world. It's the best. Yeah, I love absolutely. It. It's great. Yeah, it's such know, a fascinating game. I hope everyone plays it. <laughs> I know yeah, we I really were, want to play it at some point. I know we were a little critical of the character creation process being maybe a little bit too on rails or not sort of giving us the flexibility. I do want to say this is a lovely game. Like this is such like when you actually get to the playing of this game, it is such a lovely interesting deeply tolkien like game that it's it's wonderful i love this game Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. i i am so much wanting to play this game Uh, these characters i love them and Mm -hmm. (laughs) i want to see their shenanigans yeah Uh, (laughs) no like i said when i when i first read through it too it's like you can tell that it's very lovingly crafted that Mm -hmm. it is you know that it it comes from someone who cares very deeply about this it's not just like oh media tie-in hooray yeah um (laughs) you know like there's there's a lot of thought put into it so that's very cool well steph and james thank you both so much for joining us to talk about the wondering oh thank you for having us thank Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. You guys are the best. Aw, <laughs> you're the best. No, you're the <laughs> yes. best. I haven't gotten to talk to you two in so long because we haven't gone anywhere or done oh, anything or gone to any conventions. Yep. It was nice to yeah. catch up. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it was great. Well, can you two remind everyone where they can find you online and what sorts of things you have going on? Sure. So, uh, again, I've been Stephanie Midlock, and you can find me on the Atherbeth podcast with my co-host, Jude Vase. We are on the web at podcast.atherbeth.com, and you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Atherbeth underscore cast. And you can find me at The North Four on Twitter and Instagram, and Jude is Aramitic Jude. So if you want to learn any more about Tolkien, we we try to break things down and make it fun and silly and like a little raunchy uh, <laughs> And, you know, it's it's a lot, but um, it's a it's a fun show. So we invite all of you to come and, and take a listen. Yeah. It's it's a very fascinating podcast. I, I really like mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I'm and James, James. What about you? I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, and I'm James Pearson. I can be found editing the Atherbeth podcast. Um, and if you stay tuned in October, I think we should be releasing the third and final part of our Hobbit Ween, the One Ring actual play adventure as a bonus episode on the Atherbeth podcast. <laughs> um, I can be found on Twitter at Jay Pearson uh, and keep an eye on that space for possibly some other RPG projects in the future. Well, very cool. Thank you both again for sitting down with us and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Call to watch action. Yeah, like that. First of all, I'm really glad that we got to have Steph and James on. Um, yeah. 
I love them. They're wonderful people. Normally, they are part of my convention experience. Yes. Um, and so I've really missed them over the last couple of years. So yeah. it's been it's been a bummer to like not see people. Yeah, uh, it was good I mean, to catch up. Obviously, with them. like I we're all in that boat, but it was very nice to catch up with people that I've I've missed mm-hmm. a lot, and so I'm really glad that they could they could take the time to do this, and like the timing yeah. is perfect with the show and. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I I really like that this came out uh, at the, the same time as the, the new Lord of the Rings series, The Rings of Power. I'm, I'm enjoying the show and it's mm-hmm. it, it is really interesting seeing kind of like the the similarities between all the different character types that you're seeing in the show and like what you can play in the game itself. Yeah, after having just gone through and like made characters and everything, it's very interesting. Like watching the show and being like, "Okay, I got yeah. it. I see where you're coming from." <laughs> like the, the, you can tell that that's a really good game system that actually did capture right a that you lot really got the, the feel, the feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought that was really cool. And then like, um, it's making me also want like a, uh, you know, whatever Gandalf and company are as playable characters, but I mm-hmm. think that might be a little too OP. Yeah. Uh, so I assume that's why that's not an option. Uh, but you know, you uh, give me, give me those stats. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Cause I've been watching it with the kids. Um, Cause it's on Friday nights and yeah. um, Nate is now in middle school. And that is when I read Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. Uh, so like he's at about the same age that I was at. And so it's one of my favorite things about parenting generally is just like sharing the things that I love, like taking my kids to see Star Wars, you know, mm-hmm. like that kind of stuff. So I've been enjoying that. Um, I think he's like not quite as like into it as I am. That's but, usually the case. Um, and you can't yeah. push them because goodness, then like then the more you do, like, the more they're like, ugh, mom, ugh, stop man. forcing ugh, this mom. on us, you nerd. Right, right. <laughs> Um, I will say for people who have listened to this series now and really enjoyed these episodes, um, I do know that over on Athrobath, they just finished uh, recording their third segment of their Hobbit Ween episodes that they do every October. So there um, there are episodes in their feed from the last two years, and mm-hmm. then uh, they will have one uh, for this year as well that I know um, James runs the game for a group of a group of friends. Um, So if you want to hear the game played, you can certainly head over to the Athrobeth feed uh, and hear some of them. Absolutely. Oh, it's so good. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and stay for the amazing, like, deep dives into the Lord of the Rings lore, uh, which is just so fascinating, like the different facets of everything that you don't get just by reading the main books or watching you know the the series or the uh the movies or anything like that Yeah, it's definitely one of those like oh these are people that have had like a lot of time to think about this you know because yeah. like we all have our thing and like that's you know it was the thing i loved about making garbage of the five rings too it's just like i love people unapologetically being into things and yeah. that's that's what they're doing over there it's great yeah. it's great absolutely yeah yeah uh well having said all of that Before we let you go for the week, uh, we do have some calls to action. Uh, First up, our review bin is uh, still pretty empty at the moment. It's really sad. Uh, But we would love to hear what you think about the show. Uh, We do see reviews from all countries on Apple Podcasts, so uh, no worries about us not catching it. Uh, You can also leave reviews on Podcast Addict if you're on Android or Podchaser uh, for pretty much any device with a browser. Uh, You can also leave a rating on Spotify if you listen to us on Spotify. Uh, I think that's like all the places that really matter. We do have our Facebook page. So if you wanted to leave a review on Facebook, you certainly could, too. I, I still know, don't think I, anybody really looks at those. It's <laughs> not my favorite place, but if you put one there, we will read it. We will definitely read it if you put one there. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, every review does help us out. Uh, and uh, regardless of whether or not it helps us out uh, algorithmically, mm-hmm. uh, it really makes our day uh, whenever we come across it a new one. Good. So, yeah, it warms us our feel hearts. better. And yeah. we're in Wisconsin and it's fall now. So we're going to need getting that. Cold. We're going to need that heartwarming people. Yeah. Exactly. Please, won't you think of the podcasters? (laughs) (laughs) 
for one review ever. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you for the can low, warm low a price. podcaster hurts. Yep. The price of just one star a day. Uh, <laughs> five stars. Five stars. Five stars. All five stars. It's great. Uh, former podcast guest on Character Creation Cast and person who is also my son, Nathan, started middle school this month um, and is already working on his first fundraiser because, gosh darn it, do we not fund our public schools here? No. Uh, his music department is raising funds to buy new instruments. They want to give students scholarships for music summer camps, which I think is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, they would like to fund some field trips this year and possibly even get T-shirts for everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are selling some cookie dough, Christmas wrapping paper, weird random Christmas decor, and honestly, all kinds of other random stuff that you would find in a middle school fundraiser. Look, mm. like we've all been there. Yeah. Um, the sale is going on through September 26th. You can shop online and have it shipped to you if you want. Um, and I made him a little bit.ly link uh, with his gamer tag. So you can find Nate's fundraiser if you would like to support his weird wrapping paper cookie sale uh, <laughs> at bit.ly slash badgerfish7. There you go. In other news, I just finished editing a couple of episodes of a new bonus actual play that is coming to the One Shot Network Secret Archive uh, sometime very soon. Uh, It might actually already be there. It's not there as of the time of this this recording. Uh, But James D'Amato let me edit these episodes and throw some beautiful synth music into the actual play portion of the show. Uh, that choice of music will make sense once you know what the show is all about. But I don't know exactly what details James is throwing out there. So I'm being as vague as possible right now. Super secret podcast time. Yeah. But if you are a fan of campaign Skyjacks, uh, this does have a very similar energy to it. Uh, and my sides were splitting while editing this. Uh, I was just, uh, I lost it at so many portions. So <laughs> it's so good. Uh, but definitely keep an eye out for that. Uh, if you do have an extra five dollars to spare for the One Shot Network Patreon at patreon.com slash one shot podcast, uh, you'll get all of these episodes. Uh, and if you like what you hear, uh, please tell James and company that you liked it because then I can potentially you know edit more episodes in the future. You did like way too much equivocating on that. Everyone, if you listen to the episodes and you like what you hear, please tell James so that he can hire Ryan again and Ryan can do more of a great job and he can get paid money to do things that are fun for him. Exactly. And then I can, you know, support my family and 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 Christmas is coming up. It's nice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So thank you and everybody that that does listen. And, uh, you know, thank you for uh, telling James that you liked it other ways that you can help us out uh we are in need of some more listeners to help out if you're able to by backing us on patreon coming soon to our side quest patron levels and above or it might be in the feed already by the time this episode actually comes out Mm -hmm. uh will be a fun actual play that ryan and i did of the game summer break there will also be early release episodes with just the episode content. Whenever those are edited, as soon as Ryan gets them done, he throws them in there. It's mm-hmm. great. Um, you also get bonus outtakes for every series at all of the levels, including the $1 level. And maybe even special patron-only events uh, at certain times throughout the year at certain levels. So please absolutely check out uh, check out the patron at patreon.com slash character creation cast if you have the ability to spare a little bit towards helping us afford making this show for all of you Mm -hmm. um one of the additional perks though is we will thank you personally right here in our calls to action Uh, and we'd love to add more names to this list because you're all amazing and we would really love the opportunity to just say all of your names absolutely uh we will start as always (laughs) lieutenant thank you so much David, a.k.a. Tigranosaurus, thanks. Thank you so much to you, Eric Bontz. Matt Newton, you rock. Thank you. Shadim Cabal, you also rock. Thank you. 
<laughs> Many thanks to Daryl Holiday the second. The shyest barbarian, we appreciate your support and on all of your interaction on our Discord, honestly. You are like one of the most active people in there. So much fun to talk. Mm -hmm. We love talking to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Benjamin Sweeney, uh, I'm going to say you also rock. Thank you. We appreciate your support, Lurkin McGinnis. Thank you. Rob Fletcher, thanks. And thank you to you, Kevin Brown. And thank you to all of our future patrons. Uh, we wouldn't be able to make this show as easily without your assistance. And we truly appreciate your generosity. We absolutely do. I We have so much more cool stuff that we want to do with this show. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to everything that we can do with all of your support. Absolutely. That is all we have for today's episode. Next week, we have the week off. Maybe eventually someday. We won't have a week off. That'd be, <laughs> wouldn't that be fun? Um, but we will be back in October with a delightfully spooky game that I'm very excited for. Mm -hmm. uh, until then, stay safe, everyone. Drink some water. Relax your shoulders. Take some deep breaths. And keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter. And I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at LordNeptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permissions from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero, remixed by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guest can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you will find other great shows like Skyjack's Courier's Call. An all ages fantasy actual play podcast set in the world of Sphere. Skyjack's Courier's Call follows three teens as they set out as new apprentices aboard an airship with the Swiftwell Courier Service bringing mail and adventure across the world. Featuring Drew Marzieski, Palomi Pratap, Aaron Catano sayez and Ali Grauer, and using the Cortex Prime system. This show is perfect for anyone just getting started in listening to actual plays or veterans of the tabletop genre alike. Join clever but anxious Kieran, bold, fast-talking Cece, and loyal, strong June aboard the Red Audrin ship as they sort and deliver mail encounter powerful magic, and learn the proper skills of an Ariner along the way. Right wrongs, do mercies, and take flight. Yeah. Nail it. Yeah. All right. Waveforms are waving. Mm-hmm. Looks good. All right. Perfect. Steph, do you want to go over the ones that are in the book? Uh, no, you, you go okay. over the ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm scrolling to them. Yeah. I'm scrolling. So, I'm sorry.
I had a child intrusion. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, they want to come too. I know. Come on the adventure. All right, we can we can stop our stop our devices that are recording these uh these things. Okay, I'm going to press stop. E. Nailed it. Got it. I think I was I Got think it. I was a little too late in releasing my <gasps> click button. You messed it up. You ruined the whole it's thing. It's fine. I'll fix it. Everything's ruined forever. Forget it. We quit the no. podcast. <laughs> no, I, I have I failed my I mission. Quit. There we go. Yay, we did it. Yay, we did it. Yay, that we did it. That was so yeah. fun. That was so cool. Guys, so we made a thing. This was the best. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Do you, no? Should we stop the recording now? Yes. Okay. Okay.